This podcast is brought to you by WRFL, Radio Free Lexington. Find us online at wrfl.fm. Catch us on your FM radio while you're in Central Kentucky at 88.1 FM, all the way to the left. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe. Hello and welcome to Philosophy Bakes Bread. Food for Thought, about life and leadership. Philosophy Bakes Bread is a production of the Society of Philosophers in America, a.k.a. SOFIA. I'm Dr. Eric Thomas Weber. And I'm Dr. Anthony Cascio. A famous phrase says that philosophy bakes no bread, that it's not practical, but we and SOFIA and on this show aim to correct that misperception. Philosophy Bakes Bread airs on WRFL Lexington 88.1 and is distributed as a podcast next. Listeners can find us online at philosophybakesbread.com, and we hope you'll reach out to us on Twitter at philosophybb, on Facebook at philosophybakesbread, or by email at philosophybakesbread at gmail.com. Last but not least, you can leave us a short recorded message with a question or comment or even some soft, fluffy, bountiful praise. That we may be able to play on the show. You can reach us at 859-257-1849. That's 859-257-1849. Indeed. (laughs) Indeed. All right, everyone. We're doing something different on today's show. We're going to have an episode we're calling Philosophy Bakes Bread French Toast Edition. (laughs) You want to explain what we're talking about, Eric? Sure. So, <laughs> you know we like our bread metaphors on this show. We're going to stretch them, <laughs> bend them, break them. That's right. French toast. Yeah, what so, are we talking about, so, man? How are we making so, French toast? How do so, you make French toast? What's your favorite French toast recipe? Th- I like my little is, this, vanilla in it. It's just good stuff. <laughs> Cinnamon. Well, let, let's go back to why we have French toast. So, so the issue is that, you know, for a very long time, you know, bakers didn't have the kinds of preservatives that we have today. So, so bread would go stale. Fresh bread is delicious. Stale bread is hard and it's hard to chew and it's crystallized and it's rough, right? But it, nevertheless, it has nutri- nutrients in it. And if you get it wet, you know, it, it can be it can be good again, but then it's soggy. And so what you gotta make it soggy in the right way. <laughs> and that's what French toast is. It's one of the recipes that that wets bread and then you cook it in a certain way with egg and it becomes tasty again. You can eat it. Another great recipe that's one of my favorites is French onion soup. You put old crusty bread that's no good anymore on its own. You put it in French onion soup. All of a sudden, it gets moist and delicious, and it's good to eat again. So, so basically, we're we're our episode on, uh, that we're, <laughs> we're calling French toast is the leftover dried bread, you know, from past episodes oh, or well, things. I don't we- know. It makes it sound like it's going to be bad, but this is going to be a delicious episode. Well, that's the thing, though, right? French yeah. bread is delicious. Mm-hmm. So. As you say, you you know, I, I put in some vanilla sometimes. I put in some cinnamon. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you put in egg, right? Usually, you sweeten somehow, right? I'm, I don't know. Oh, Maybe yeah. a little sweeten. sugar, I guess. Little, little sugar. little powdered sugar on top, some some syrup. That's always good. Yeah. You yeah. put some butter in the pan and so on. And then you're I'm very ooh. hungry. I should have eaten more. <laughs> <laughs> I just had lunch, but I'm talking about it anyway. I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to eat less bread, which, of course, means all I want to eat is bread. Anyway. <clears throat> <laughs> so this is our French bread episode, which kind of means it's our grab bag of materials from from past episodes, and we've got a couple morsels from, especially that are going to be the most, the main chunks or the biggest focus of this episode. You want to tell them about that, Anthony? Yeah, that's right. So in this first segment, we have some listener voicemail that maybe slipped through the crack or we didn't get a chance to respond to yet, and so we're going to listen to those. And yep. Eric and I are going to respond to them. So if you called in and you're like, "Oh, they never played my message." We're going to play it now. We're going to listen to them now. And in the second and third segment, we're going to play some snippets that we recorded this past summer in upstate Maine with a Perion Expedition. If you listen to Aperon Expedition. <laughs> always do that. Aperon Expedition. Um, upper West Bank of, no, on the w- Upper West upper Branch West. of the P- Penobscot River, right? Yeah, yeah. It was an awesome trip that Eric and I took in August, and we recorded an episode up there on outdoor education. Episode 74, if you want to listen to that. But so we, we recorded some sitting on the bank of the river under the stars. We recorded a little bit as we were paddling down the river, and we had some wonderful conversations. So we're going to edit those up and play little snippets of that for you. And it was, I think, hopefully you'll enjoy it as much as we did. And yeah. 
In the last segment, we're going to talk about 2018, recap what we did, some of our favorite episodes, some of your listeners' favorite episodes. And yep. we're think about our, the greatest hits of 2018, right? Some French toast, sprinkle it with some sugar. Yep. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sounds good. So so we should do a little bit of introduction about the, the guests who are in segments two and three today. We're going to call segment two By the River because I remember recording conversations by the river, where actually when we first got to northern Maine, Anthony went swimming, I laid on some rocks and was resting, and we had these these further guests in our episode on the show who were in episode 74. That was Ben Vockley, Seth Walton, and Alex Strong. Hi, guys. Uh, and and yeah, hi, guys, and, th- and thanks again for what was a really fun trip with y'all. Ben Vockley has long worked with Outward Bound. And Seth Walton is a high school teacher who is also a registered Maine guide, a guide in Maine. It's kind of a big deal to be a registered Maine guide. And Alex Strong is the owner and operator of Aperon Expeditions. That's A-P-E-I-R-O-N. Ape Iron. Ape Iron Expeditions.com. Aperon means the boundless. You know, philosophers like things like that. So those are the guests. I lectured about that today in class. Oh, is that right? Yeah. What did you have to say about the boundless? Oh, we were talking about the pre-Socratics. So I was talking about... Um, what Was the conversation endless? Yeah, it felt like it. The students' eyes were... <laughs> You're like, this oh is God, a boundless will, conversation. Please. Will this ever end? Wrap it up. Oh, Lord. I doubt that. Everybody, you, you know already if you've heard our, you know, our episodes that Anthony Cascio is a multiple award-winning teacher. And uh, so I'm sure, I'm sure they enjoyed it. But No pressure. <laughs> now that we've introduced everyone, do you want to listen to yeah, some voicemails? So, yeah, I don't believe that all of our callers identified themselves, but our first one is from Sean, who, is, who well, he tells you that uh, in, in our voicemail that he studies here at the Uni- University of Kentucky and was listening to the radio. In particular, he was responding to a rerun episode. Let me give a little bit of, of context for that. So as I mentioned, the show airs first on the radio and then it comes out in the podcast. Well, in 2017, when we launched the show, we did a new episode every week and it was intense. And I think it nearly killed us to try and follow was, that schedule. It was, it was busy intense. time. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, in 2018, we decided to slow down a bit and to do a new episode every two weeks, which has still been a challenge, but much more manageable. We can and, in- increase our quality of episodes for our listeners. Or just not die from doing this. You yes, know, that's also. the other thing. <laughs> and in the, you know, at the same time, we got to be, you know, I got to be on the radio every week with, with this stuff. And so what I've been doing is airing rerun episodes from the prior year in 2018. And so in at, early on in the year, at, we reran episode 10 with Scott Stroud on media ethics. Scott is at the University of Texas at Austin, and, and the voicemail will mention the question that he raised and the listeners' thoughts about that. So here is Sean at the University of Kentucky. Hi, this is Sean. I'm a neuroscience student at UK, and I was listening to your radio show, The Philosophy Baked Bread, and the question posited was, how do we simultaneously maintain our own points of view on certain things while hearing out other people's point of views? And I, I like to have a lot of uh, controversial discussions with people frequently or as frequently as I can. And uh, my, my approach is to have my positions on things backed up by evidence or at least, you know, good reason, good reasoning and logic. And I, I expect the same from someone else. So someone from a different country or a different walk of life has a different idea on something I do, I'm always welcome to hear it, but it, it does have to stand up to the same rigor that I, you know, put my, uh, my own beliefs to. And I'm not, you know, I'm not one that would just accept someone's point of view just on principle. I, you know, they're not all equally valid. And so regardless of culture or, or whatever. And so that's, that's my point of view. So cool. Thanks. Bye. Well, first of all, thanks so much, Sean. That was a really great voicemail. That was really nice. Thanks, Sean. And I can't, it's hard to disagree with it, right? I mean, hold everyone to the same standard of, what did he say? Evidence, good reasoning and logic, and you're good to go. Well, when we first listened to that that voicemail, Anthony, I understand that you did have some points you wanted to raise, at least in consideration, not necessarily disagreeing with Sean. Yeah, I don't necessarily disagree. Well, it, so when you're talking to someone, and especially when you're like 
let's have a, a logical and reasonable conversation. You're assuming that you understand what good reasoning is and they understand what good reasoning is. And you actually agree on what counts as evidence and what counts as good logic. But it turns out not everyone agrees at all about those things, which kind of gets it tricky. So I could be talking to you, Eric, and you think you're presenting a very reasonable argument with good evidence. And I'm also presenting a reasonable argument with good evidence, but we have sort of different worldviews, different points of view. And we're just arguing past each other. We don't, it's really hard to connect and talk to each other. So for instance, you say, Hey, let's have a reasonable conversation. I say, yes, let's do that. I shall bring out my evidence and I open my Bible and I say, uh, you know, it says the Bible says this, this, and this, and there is my evidence. And thus I have proven my point. And you kind of go, well, hold on. I don't believe that at all. And suddenly we're at an impasse and Mm -hmm. I presented what I think is extremely reasonable evidence. And you disagree with, with the reasonableness of the evidence. And so Almost the first time, right, the original question was about sort of how do we talk to, right, people with different points of view. And the real first step seems to me that especially if they're from another culture or another country, you have to make sure that you understand where their point of view is, Mm -hmm. right? If you, in one, in the points of view really can determine our, what counts as evidence and what counts as, as good reasoning processes, so, so I mean, you know, let, let's think about an example that that can come up where you know someone right here in Kentucky thinks that the world is six thousand years old, mm-hmm. right? Because Scripture says X about the age of the world, but even you know, you say across cultures, heck, you know, from you know Lexington, Kentucky to small town and you know in Clinton County. Right. You, you could have very different points of view, just, you know, not very far apart. You know what I mean? Right, on, so I think on, that, is, that is deepens the point. I mean, if this is all the different points of view within one culture, imagine how different it can be the minute you expand that. R- right. You know, but at the same time, it, it's not unreasonable to, to, you know, wonder whether we couldn't have standards of excellence that could cut across standards of evidence, excuse me, that could cut across cultures like even the Vatican has come to acknowledge that evolution is in fact how, you know, animals developed on earth. Mm -hmm. The difference that the, that the Pope has said is that it wasn't random, right? You know, you know, God intended these things for instance, but nevertheless, I mean, you know, someone who doesn't think animals evolved isn't, is, is for some reason more conservative than the oldest institution in the world, the Catholic church. How, how I'm, not saying, I'm not saying you, know that you have to disagree or agree with them. I'm saying if you want to have if you want right. to have a conversation, you have to begin by understanding their point of view. Understanding right. someone's point of view does not mean that you have to agree with them at all. Right. You just understanding like this person's. If I talk to someone who's just come from the Creation Museum in right. Kentucky, I know I know they're probably going to hit me with Bible verses and any amount of scientific evidence I present otherwise will be it won't count as evidence. It will be useless. So you have to think about there that, or, you know, maybe will be useless depending on the, maybe. the hypothetical situation, yeah. but right. And so that lets you be a little bit more pluralistic and open in your conversation with other people. But it doesn't mean you have to agree with them. Not at all. Right, right, right. Oh, I mean, I, I, I'm, I certainly appreciate the idea of being respectful at the same time. When we talk about, for instance, on the news, making sure that we give things, different points of view, reason, you know, different reasonable points. I'm of view not even suggesting consideration. that I'm not even suggesting that it is respectful, respectful. I'm not even suggesting it's respectful, right? I'm saying that if you want to be good at thinking, you oh, got to be I understand. See. You got to be able to understand that they're coming from a different system. Oh, I see. Yeah, thinking. yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, you don't have to. You can look at their system and go. I understand exactly what you're saying and why you're saying <laughs> it and why you're understanding it. I still think you're a hundred percent wrong and possibly immoral for thinking it. <laughs> All right. But if you don't understand that, you can't meet them on those same standards. You can't have a conversation on the same standards if you're not argue. If you don't, if you disagree about, so you agree yeah. that we have to have standards, but you disagree about. The standards of those standards. I see. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, yeah. And it doesn't I mean, have anything to do yeah. with respect. I don't think so at all. It could lead to respect and often does lead to respect and hopefully yeah. it'll lead to respect on both parties, but not necessarily. I mean, boy, I'm going to get us in trouble. But if someone comes to me with talking about anti vaccination right. stuff, I just look at them and go, you're wrong. You're yeah. flat out wrong. You're a wrong yeah. person. <laughs> you're There's an the epidemic wrong, right now. Ideas, right? There's all these epidemics. Yeah. There's too much good evidence otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. And for what I consider to be good evidence. 
R- right now in Portland, actually, there's a measles epidemic because of anti-vaccination. And I'm so sad for the for the kids, especially. Yeah, I saw that someone had a someone took a kid to a sporting event who had measles, Uh-oh. and there's oh, a God. big measles outbreak because of that. Yep. Oh man. Well, so, we've got some more voicemails, but well, uh, I, I, one more thing I'm going to add to that. Yeah, if yeah, you yeah. want to be good at thinking, right? And practice better thinking, being aware of your own biases and the biases of others will be part of that. Right. True. And so true. if you, if being able to practice seeing someone else's point of view actually will be part and parcel of becoming better at arguing and communicating with other people. That's, That's I, true. I, 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 I really believe that. And so just being aware yeah. of someone else's biases sort of make you self-reflect on your own. And then you realize kind of, Right. Why am I not be able to communicate with this person is because we take different things as evidence. Yeah. And here's an extension of that. You know, we, you know, one who's open minded, I like to think I'm open minded. Right. We can often confront situations or matters about which we just haven't thought much about. And so, you know, that's similar to having a, a disposition that's not very well considered. You know what I mean? Like, I don't need to get into it, but, but I've had my eyes opened about some things recently with the, you know, Mary Kondo and all the clutter I have in my house. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I just, I've never, never, never that thought about some of this episode. stuff. We, we, it we does. Looking for joy in our mess. <laughs> exactly. Well, let's get to this next, next uh, voicemail. We, you know, we're going to have a long first segment, I think, but oh, I think it's funny. I'm sorry. I just got yeah, no, no, that's that. okay. We, we, we got two more. Here we go. This is in regarding your discussion you had on self-help. You know, on, on your philosophy section, and I uh, heard a thing by George Carlin once, which is an interesting, here's a philosophical question. If you are reading a self-help book, is that self-help, or isn't that just help? Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from that's the great fun. philosopher George Carlin. I love that. <laughs> I think that's in reference, I'm not sure, but I think that was in reference to episode 75, All Philosophies is Stage with Monica McCarthy, that episode uh, where, where we just had at one point, I think, mentioned self-help and, you know, we might have been dismissive of it or, or you know, here and there positive about it, whatever. But th- thank you so much. George Carlin is pretty pretty hilarious. I, I just have one quick thought about this, which is to say that, you know, sometimes you can get help from others to to help, you know, teach you how to help yourself. So I, I would say it's a bit of both. I, I think that's funny and it's fair, but but someone else can teach me how to help myself too. I, I think actually a good education does that. There you go. You All do right, the we last, have, last call? Yeah, we got one more voicemail. This will be a little bit long of a first segment, but that's okay. This one is about, it was a voicemail again about a rerun where we reran the episode with Dr. Shook on, all shook up about World War III, where we talked for briefly about motorcycle helmets, which aren't required in the state of Kentucky to be worn when you're riding a motorcycle. And then we had this caller call in about, about that rerun and this issue. Here we go. Hi, this is Rob Lawrenson from Lexington, Kentucky. I thought it was a uh, interesting discussion about the uh, seatbelt laws. I, I definitely believe in the helmet law, but I think the question that that I think about is the enforcement. When you require seatbelts, you're requiring the manufacturer of the vehicle to provide seatbelts, and those seatbelts, I don't know, they may or may not be certified by the NTSB or whoever it may be. But for helmets, you can't have a motorcycle company provide a helmet because it could be lost. It's not connected to the vehicle itself. So then you're requiring a separate purchase. Does that purchase have to come before the motor or before the purchase in the motorcycle? Does that helmet have to be certified? So it requires, requires a lot of other thought than just yes or no, we need helmets, but who provides that? Who certifies that? Can I just wrap bubble wrap on my head or does it need to be actually safe? Thank you. Well, that was another awesome voicemail. Thanks, Rob. I don't know who our second caller was, but we we do know the name of Sean and Rob, our first and third callers. Thanks um, for calling, guys. I yeah, will say, we, don't wrap bubble don't wrap bubble wrap on your head and just drive well, around. That if you do, unsafe. make sure you put a helmet on top of it. Is what <laughs> I would say. <laughs> And remember, folks, if you want to call us and leave us a voicemail, remember that you can reach us at 859-257-1849. All right, Anthony, what do you think about this voicemail? I really like this voicemail. I've, 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 I've been tickled. I just love the, the fact that, you know, we brought this up sort of casually. Was it, would you say episode two yeah, of the show? Three, two or three, three yeah. of the show. 
And it's just this isn't a, a debate that keeps coming back up again and again, This the, the helmet laws, because uh, exactly what extent can you require it? I appreciate the calls because it added a wrinkle to the conversation that I just hadn't considered before. So, you know, speaking of last call, we always right. – you know, being self-critical, I had never thought about the fact, you know, seatbelts. So you're right. The, they just, they come standard with the car. They're in there. Helmets do not. So it adds a sort of interesting wrinkle in thinking about the, both the ethics of helmet laws and also the, the policy implementation of it. Right. I still think we need helmet laws. Probably. I mean, the, 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 I mean again, for, for those who aren't aware in the state of Kentucky, you do not have to wear a helmet when you ride a motorcycle. And, and I mean, I was shocked when I saw someone riding by me who didn't have a helmet on. I thought, oh, my goodness, you're going to die. <laughs> Please don't die. Right. You know, but but evidently this person was not violating the rules. And to the point that the that the a seatbelt is attached to the car versus, you know, the helmet is not attached to the motorcycle. I'm I'm not so sure that that is such an issue. Let's say we required a key for every car. I don't know that we do require a key for every car except for the practical purpose of, of you know being able to start a car but a key is not yeah. physically attached to the car you know what I mean like you could you know you can have yeah, an on button or whatever everyone mm-hmm. Gets a key when they buy a car. You do get. So in just, other words, exactly. So, you know, I suggested my way of thinking about this. Maybe you know the the uh, motorcycle is sold with a helmet, and that you just always have to buy a helmet with it unless you can show that you already have one, and then you get a discount. I don't know. That seems fair, right? Yeah. So, so that's the other thing, and and I, I mentioned to you earlier, Anthony, before this conversation, before this recording, anyway, that that you know if you if you have a child at a hospital, you're not allowed. They don't let you leave the hospital in a car unless you have a proper car seat for that child. So in other words, you know, there can be some body which regulates, you know, what a safe helmet is going to be. And and then you have to have that kind of approved helmet to be able to leave the lot with a motor- motorcycle. So maybe you can buy the motorcycle. You're just not allowed to ride it off the lot unless you're wearing an approved helmet. I mean, if well, you isn't, put- that, isn't that what the laws, with states that have that law and that what they already say? It may, it may be what they do. I just, it's not what they do in the state of Kentucky. So I'm just talking about, you know, you know, what are some ways of thinking about how to require this? The fact that you'd need some other body to you know say what a safe helmet is it doesn't sound to me like such an obstacle i mean you know that sounds like something you know very very doable as far as just you know as, as there's a code of a safety standard that what it, what it requires to have a helmet you gotta if you're going to sell these as that kind of approved helmet it's you know it'll be marked as such and when you show up to get your motorcycle to show that you have that kind of helmet boom they let you have it and as you say if, if you don't have it then you have to buy buy a helmet from them. And then, you know, if you have it, you could get a discount or something like that. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's a good solution. Yeah. No, I just, I just like the fact that, cause you know, it brings in another, you know, manufacturer, another level of, 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 you know, now you're required to buy something from somewhere else. Whereas with a seatbelt, you just never have to think about it because it's just there. So I like, you know, I don't think it's yeah. wrong for the seatbelt laws. I don't really think it challenges it too much. It just adds an extra layer of uh, consideration. Yeah. But as, as we said before though, number one, you're no person is an island, and so when you're on the roads and, and and you make an accident more dangerous, you know by virtue of not wearing a helmet, then then that does affect other people's car insurance. You know what I mean? And, and at the you same said- time, we care about people. We we want you to be. We want don't want you to die on the road, which is why we put guardrails. Why we do you know have safety standards? You know, it's a it's a good thing. It it saves lives. You know what I mean? If you want to be on your own private property and and do something crazy, well, that may be up to you, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for that voicemail, Rob. Thanks, Rob. And and, and Sean and whoever our caller two was. Thank you, caller two. (laughs) We always appreciate George Carlin quotes. So George Carlin is fun. We really appreciate that. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening to this first segment of Philosophy Bakes Bread, our, our French toast episode of 2019 which may become a repeated thing where we have our grab bag of old stale bread that we make palatable again, I hope, (laughs) you know, based on, you know, looking back at a year. Right. And so we're going to come back after a short break to jump into, you know, thoughts on the river with Seth Walton, Ben Vockley and Alex strong. This is Eric Weber. My co-host is Anthony Cascio. Thanks everybody for listening. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to Philosophy Bakes Bread. We're listening to a special French toast episode where we're taking some (laughs) snippets from the past year that 
maybe we, we miss slip through the cracks and we're we're soaking them up with happiness and joy cooking them up, serving them to you. Uh, in this segment, we have a little bit of audio that Eric and I recorded on the Upper West Branch of the Penobscot River in Maine with Aperion Expeditions. Um, That's pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> I like, changed it midway. Aperion Expeditions. Aperion. Uh, I, I really think it's Aperion. I've always heard of uh, Aperion. That's how I was well, taught by... There's no I uh, before the O. That's that is Greek. <laughs> I was taught Aperon from Tom Alexander, so that's where I got it from. I realized that the other day when I was teaching it. You're listening to recordings with Ben Vockley, Seth Walton, and Alex Strong that we recorded on the upper west branch of the Penobscot River when we were on a canoe trip with Aperon Expeditions this summer if you want to hear a episode what was it episode 74 i'm pretty sure on outdoor education you can hear from that episode so take a listen here we are by the river approaches. <sighs> See, one of my completely irrational beliefs is that you can't have been to a place until you've submerged yourself completely in their water. <laughs> I have no way of backing up that belief other than I know that it's 100% true. Cashio's words of wisdom. Everywhere I go. If you go there, you haven't been there. Until you've eaten their food and swum in their water. All right, probably, Anthony. Probably being raised Catholic. <laughs> What's up? I got a question for uh-huh. you. Uh-huh. Why did you want to come on this trip? Well, a hunter reached out to us. And I thought, what a fantastic opportunity to go to a part of the world I've never been to. To... Go on a kind of trip I've always wanted to go on. I've never been on canoeing up and down rivers, and it's the farthest north I've ever been in North America. <laughs> so took an a great Alabama boy out of the south, right? And then to talk about life and philosophy around a campfire with people who are interested in doing so, you know, and not just annoying people who are like, "Why are you doing this to me, Anthony?" That's, <laughs> what a great opportunity that is. <sighs> is this something you're doing for its own sake? What do you mean? Are you doing this for its own sake, or are you doing it for some other goal What's or this? purpose? This trip. <sighs> Can it be both? In this case, for its own sake, almost certainly. But can it be both? Yeah. I mean, so I gave you a bunch of reasons why I wanted to go. Those are doing the trip for those reasons, but also for its own sake. Right. Well, the, the reasons are based on the sake of this trip, right? Yeah, this is true. Uh, gosh. How's the water? It's really nice. Look how beautiful this is. I think I might need to get in. Yes, it is. Over there is really nice. Um, what I about want, you? Why'd you come on this trip? Uh, hold on, we got we got to have you closer, and it doesn't count unless you say it and get it recorded. <laughs> Give your full name and, and uh, what you do. <laughs> My name. social security <laughs> number. No social security number. <laughs> your inmate number. My inmate number. My full name, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my name is uh, Seth Douglas Walton. Uh, hi, Seth. Uh, hi. And I'm a high school teacher sometimes, and I'm also a main guide. So I, I take people out into the... We should be clear that you're not the main guide. But I am not the main guide the main on this guide. trip at all. I'm no, just no. here. I'm here. He means the guide of trips in Maine. I'm a, the guide of trips in Maine, but not the main guide of this trip, for sure. I'm just a participant and a happy paddler and a happy uh, uh, enjoyer of philosophy on this Excellent. trip. Yeah. 
Uh, I don't normally get to go out into the wilderness and not have to be in charge of everything, so I'm... That is nice. Which is part of the reason I want to do this, but also because I am just have a very curious mind and like to, you know, have discussions about, you know, uh, things that relate to philosophy and... Life. Um, and life, and also, you know, I, I haven't paddled this, the West Branch of the Penobscot yet, and... Uh, and I and I met Alex a couple months ago at a at a uh, wilderness training, and uh, it just seemed like a good fit. And then I read the description. I was like, Oh yeah, that's for me. Awesome. But, yeah. So so that here makes, I am. That makes so, me very happy. Yeah. So why why do you get out in the it's wilderness? Good. Why do you come out of the woods? Aren't our homes like more comfortable with fewer bugs? Yeah. I I don't know. I always feel better when I'm outside. I just you know, mm-hmm. and I think. There's a lot of reasons for that, and I, and I think I could go on and on, but but I think it's just you know, a lot of t- it forces us to, to really change our you know our, our reference points in our life if we we um, go to a place that's not that we haven't created necessarily you know so, so it's nice. a good chance for us to get outside of oh, like the that. world that we've created. It's nice and humbling. Yeah, and and then uh, then you see who who you are or who you're not which is also just as important <laughs> I, I love this wilderness i have to say i'm really glad i brought my bug spray though yes <laughs> yeah well and this is the great time of year because a month ago and, and uh, <laughs> we wouldn't be able to be having this conversation without like netting everywhere swarms. Yeah. yeah swarms and black flies yeah so this is a this is a good t- this time in the in the fall are a really great time so right on yeah. there are no fewer than five little fishies just eating away at my foot down here. Thank you, Seth. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to this trip. Oh, Excellent. We'll talk a lot more, too. Hey, Ben. Yo. Come introduce yourself. you got to st- stand on this side because the mics oh, are pointed gasp. that way. Are you getting enough? Are you getting enough? You don't have to do this if you don't gasp. want to. Oh, no, I'd love to. Awesome. I'm just being weird because I'm no, weird. That's great. <laughs> ben, give us your full name, please, Ooh. and who you are in short. Cool. Okay, so my name is Ben Vockley. I am... Among many other things, a outward bound instructor. Oh, uh, I ask you about outward and, bound a lot. <laughs> oh, feel free to ask me about it. I love talking about what I do. And I am here partially just to kind of, as Seth said, get, get away from the having to think about what the, the group is doing every moment of being in the outdoors, kind of being able to come back out and say, oh yeah, this is why I do what I do. We can let Alejandro stress, right? Exactly. Yeah. We can let him stress, <laughs> and we can relax and enjoy ourselves, and it'll all be good. I'm liking it already. <laughs> We've been here like half an hour, and I'm feeling better. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's also because the the topic is going to be really interesting. Awesome. Um, the love of life. It's something that I'm incredibly in love with. The <laughs> To make it sound ridiculous, I don't think it's ridiculous. Not at all. Loving life, exactly. No, in love with in love with loving life. Yeah, that's what it is. So, 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 (laughs) why do you go outdoors? Why do you do this kind of trip? Like, not just necessarily this one, but but why do you kind of get out into the wilderness like this? I have this personal philosophy that is kind of finding wonder in everything. Wonder is something that is incredibly important to me as a person and being able to give that to others and show others the wonder of being outdoors and the wonder of life in general through the outdoors is something that I have a great passion for. If you don't mind my follow-up, what about the outdoors do you think helps with wonder, because like I can, oh, <laughs> well, I can I can wonder when the next bus is coming. I can wonder whether I left the you know the furnace on or the the oven on. You know, so like wonder when I'm talking that, about not wonder, that kind of wonder, not that kind of wonder. Yeah, when I'm talking about wonder, I don't necessarily mean I wonder about this, but in in a higher sense, the big picture, um, the big picture, the yeah. the wonder of seeing a incredible view as we're seeing now with the river flowing past us um, and the the trees on the other side with the sun going down behind them and saying wow this is something that is absolutely incredible to see and this specific site is something that 
no one else in the world other than those who are here with us now will ever see this exact site ever again. Nice. Um, and being able to take that in and enjoy it for what it is. Was it Heraclitus who said you can't step in the same river twice? Anthony? Roughly, paraphrasing. <laughs> well, so in, other, in other words, you, so like, the, when, you, when you're sitting when the in your... the waters keep moving on and on. And well, on. When, mm-hmm. when you're sitting in your cubicle, right? No one has ever experienced this five minutes in your cubicle. But in a sense, like, what changes in the cubicle over, over, over five minutes, whereas the river is always moving, right? Right. It's, the river is always moving. The river, the water that we are seeing go past right now is never going to be in this spot again other than in the fact of the cycle of water continues and there might be some molecule of this water that eventually ends up back in this river. But in, in, this, in the scenery here that's so beautiful and everything, you're also glad you brought your bug spray, right? I'm not currently wearing bug oh, spray. Oh, you're not wearing bug spray? I'm not wearing bug spray if, if you... Uh, wow. Could see me, <laughs> for those listening. <laughs> right on. <laughs> um, I'm wearing... Long pants and long sleeves. Oh, and okay, so you have another dealing solution. with dealing with it in a different way. <laughs> I see, I see. But I, but I, I guess what I'm saying is like nature's lovely when we do those things that help us keep it comfortable, right? Oh, it's true, it's true. But at the same time, because it'll bite you in the ass, uh, right? Nature, <laughs> oh, it, it sure can bite you in the ass <laughs> sometimes. In shoulder. Some but just at the same time, in the shoulder. <laughs> at the same time, it's kind of incredible to experience those moments where it's it's a hard thing and you're struggling through it there's the these things called the the types of fun you have type one fun and you have type two fun oh i gotta hear about the types of fun yeah type one fun fun. yeah there is type one fun is holy crap it's fun in the moment you're just having a blast type two fun is it's pretty miserable in the moment but then you look back on it afterwards, and you realize that it, everything was worth it, and it was so much fun. Nice. So you can kind of look at it like that. There are more, but those are the two. Those are the two that I like. I like that. So I'm about. enjoying the scenery. This is a beautiful moment. But then every now and then I get bitten by mosquitoes, and right. and I can I can focus on that, or I can think of the big picture and how delightful it was. Right. Or or maybe there's. Tomorrow there's going to be a torrential downpour all day. I really True. hope there's not. Uh, <laughs> Me too. That wouldn't be great. That. Uh, I, don't, I don't have any here. I'll just knock on my head to knock on some wood there. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a tree over there. But looking not at listening. that, at the same time as in the moment, it, it's kind of miserable. Yeah. You look back on it afterwards, maybe even after you've gotten home. And it's this experience of, you know, even though it sucked in the moment, it was pretty cool and awesome to have made it through a rainstorm in the outdoors while I'm paddling a canoe down the river. <laughs> like that. you, that's the fun you you appreciate afterwards. Exactly, right? <laughs> that's the fun you appreciate <laughs> afterwards. A few weeks ago, I was with my family at a lake. Mm-hmm. We were out, kind of you know, floating lake, playing in the water, and just a big thunderstorm popped up out of nowhere. And we just got, my kids were all huddling in our blankets, and we were getting, it was pa- pelting us, and it was hailing on us, and it was, it, was, it hurt. Oh, it was awful. We kind of trying to chase, it was, it was bad. It was a real bad thing. Oh, yeah. Right, and then we just got caught in it. One and of those. Then, of course, I asked my kids what their favorite part of the entire vacation was. And they said the thunderstorm. Getting caught in the thunderstorm was hey, their favorite yeah. part of the vacation. Let me give a quick John Locke's theme about sort of the, the first kind of fun. We can, we can sometimes miss it. There was a beautiful woodland creature, whatever the heck that was, in the background while we were talking. That's true. I was hearing that, too. That was uh, most likely a squirrel or a chipmunk of some sort. It's the cutest squirrel sound I've ever heard. Yeah, a little little chittering, yelling (laughs) at something or another. Hopefully they won't start gnawing at my feet. Yeah, they're evil little critters sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thanks so much, Ben. Of course. Glad to talk. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed this second segment of Philosophy Bakes Bread here in our first French toast episode where we sort of take some left behind bread and and give it new life, right? And we we had some sort of leftovers of things we'd recorded on our trip on the Upper West Branch of the Penobscot River when we were with Ben Vockley, Seth Walton, Alejandro Strong, and my co-host, Anthony Cascio, and myself, Eric Weber. We're going to come back after a short break with a little bit more of our recordings on a river in Maine. We'll be right back.
If you're hearing this, that means podcast advertising works. WRFL is now accepting new applications for advertising in a selection of our original podcast series. If you or someone you know owns a business in Central Kentucky and would be interested in advertising on WRFL's original podcasts, please email development at wrfl.fm. Welcome back, everyone, to Philosophy Bakes Bread. You're listening to a special, delicious, tasty French toast episode of Philosophy Bakes Bread. We've been taking <laughs> snippets and phone calls from the past year and sopping them up in, in delicious sauces and serving them up to you. In the last segment, we were by the river with Ben Vockley, Seth Walton, Alex Strong, and myself and Eric uh, having a wonderful conversation. I think we should just get right back to it. All right, Anthony, speak loudly and explain where we are. Hi, everyone. Eric and I and friends are currently paddling down the upper west branch of the Penobscot River. Enjoying a beautiful scenery. Two giant bald eagles just flew by. That's no joke. It's a beautiful, beautiful afternoon. Morning. I don't actually know what time it is. That is actually one of the awesome things about this trip. I don't know what time it is either. We're following a path that Henry David Thoreau went down. Is that right, Alex? That is correct. Well, he put on river just a little downstream of us. There's a heron up there. You see it? Yeah. Up the river. Up the river. So, in his book, Locks talks about something that Aristotle brought up, which is part of happiness, according to Aristotle, and it has to do with activities that we engage in, in which we lose track of time. Hmm. And Aristotle and several other people, have, including George Santayana and Locks and so on, say that you know, part of the spiritual, part of the really most joyous parts of life have to do with virtuous activities we engage in and lose track of time. And as Locks put it, you kind of get a bit of a taste of the eternal, not because time isn't passing, but because, you know, you don't, you don't feel it. You know, you, you're wrapped up in this virtuous activity. So I guess one question is... You know, what are activities people engage in, we engage in, in which we lose track of time? Activities that are polite to talk about in company? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, certain things you can't say on the radio. All right. Mm. So let's... Uh, wait, wait, nudge, nudge. Imagine your kids in the car listening to the program. Mm. How about that? Sure. Who doesn't like reading a good book? Yeah. Getting lost in the good book? Woodworking. Right on. Carving a canoe paddle. Ooh. Yeah, we've got some beautiful canoe paddles we're using today. A canoe paddle featuring a really nice logo of Aperon Expeditions. It's pretty cool. Besides the one that Seth made by hand, these paddles are made by Shaw and Tenney, which is a company in Orno, Maine, that's been around since the time Thoreau did his trip. No I'm way. Not sure what kind of paddles he had, but um, this is the, the same technology that was making paddles then is what they use to make these today. Wow. It's beautiful. A little time travel today. Looks like white oak. Uh, or is it ash? It's probably ash. Oh. It's awful. Oh, that's not popular. Uh, 
I'm not I'm trying to remember what they use. Yeah, that could be that could be ash. Ash is a little more expensive. Yeah. yeah. If it's heavy, it's, it's ash. If it's lighter, it's spruce. Wood. I think it's yeah, they're lighter. So it's ash. This is what kind of wood would you? Brought to you by Philosophy Baked Bread. <laughs> Eric, I would say that an activity for me that helps me lose track of time is actually when I'm in the front of a boat and I get to paddle and just focus on the strokes I'm doing, mm. to focus on putting my paddle in the water. And I don't really have to worry about what direction I'm going because the person in the back is kind of taking care of that. And sometimes I'll actually close my eyes or just look down into the boat and just at first I'll be focusing on doing my strokes well, but eventually um, each paddle stroke is kind of your body takes over a little bit. And there's that relationship between the paddle, the water, the boat, and you. And you just kind of get lost in that relationship. You get to just kind of slide forward as your body keeps resetting, pulling back, resetting, pulling back. And I think that that reminds me a lot of what Lox is talking about, that kind of taste of the eternal. Here, here. Nice, nice description of what I'm doing out there. <laughs> I was like, oh, he's narrating my life at the moment. Yeah. So I think there's just something really simple and beautiful about getting to take part in that history and feeling it work well. I'm sort of mesmerized by the really lovely warm sun with a cool breeze and my, my fingers occasionally touching the water and cooling off. It's, uh, it's bliss. Is that type 1 bliss? I think this is type 1 bliss, sure. <laughs> type, type 1? Type 4 bliss, where it's blissful now and you know it's going to be blissful because it's blissful now. Later. Mm. <laughs> Is that when you hope you don't get a blister? Mm. Uh, uh, sorry. Sorry, I'm drinking coffee. That's fine. There's a good bit of joy, Alejandro was saying, in paddling along and then every now and then taking a quick stop between paddle strokes to take a sip of coffee. Whatever your favorite beverage is, I'm drinking coffee this morning. And then just going back to business. I gotta say, the sound of the paddles is pretty lovely. Stolen pleasures. There, there's something Lox, I think, would appreciate. This idea of enjoying the sound of paddles. Were you his student? I was. In undergrad or grad school? Undergrad. I was actually, I'd, I'd taken one philosophy class, and I was going in to, you know, meet the professor who had taught my one philosophy class to ask him about majoring in philosophy. Yeah. And at Vanderbilt, everyone had heard of this guy, John Locke's. Yeah. You know, people told stories that Dead Poet Society was based on him. Mm-hmm. It's probably hyperbole, but it's a fun story to tell. Okay, it's just such such a good teacher, you know. And I was walking towards this other professor's office, and Lox's office is first on the way. And I saw him, you know, standing there in his office. He'd probably just come back from a class or something. And um, I just sta- stopped and he sort of stared at him. And I was thinking about all I'd heard about him. 
And he said, he looked at me and he said, hey, come on in, what's up? So I, I headed in and I felt a little, you know, odd. I said, well, you know, you don't know who I am, but I'm thinking about majoring in philosophy and, you know, was wondering if you'd be my advisor. And he said, sure, come on in, sit down. And that was, that was 20 years ago. What was the first class you took with them? The first class I took with locks? Yeah. Good question. Uh, your, like, first memorable? The fir- first, first class I took with him was on 19th century philosophy. He, he was teaching Hegel, Schopenhauer, and Royce. And it had to do, in a sense, with optimism, pessimism, and, you know, social obligations, basically. You know, this idea that Hegel thought that history was proceeding towards, a, you know, a given end. Namely Hegel. And, and namely Hegel, and, and sort of towards progress, you know, mm-hmm. and... And we talked about Schopenhauer as being, you know, very pessimistic and seeing everything as suffering and, you know, will resisting itself and everything. Mm-hmm. And then we ended with Royce. And I, it was, it blew me away. It was this sophisticated explanation of how there can be evil in the world, acknowledging Schopenhauer, right? And yet uh, Royce obviously was a was a Christian and a religious believer, and he had to address the problem of evil. How can there be, you know, such a great God and so much evil in the world? And Locke's, you know, taught me that Royce's answer was that these three things, the omnipotence, omniscience, and omnibenevolence, so being all-powerful, you know, being, you know, all-knowing, and all loving, all good. One of those you have to give on. And um, Royce's answer was that God is the most powerful, but not all powerful. He can know all, he can mean well, and do the best that can be done, yet not make a world that would be without suffering. And so, it, you know, I thought it was a, a beautiful explanation for the problem of evil, as that's known. And what, what Royce takes that to mean, though, is therefore there is an enormous obligation for individuals in the world to participate in diminishing suffering. Mm-hmm. That there's going to be suffering in the world that's inevitable, and we can help or make things worse, and... Our obligation is profound, and that we participate in making the world as it could be, or we can. That that class blew me away. Because in a sense it had this positivity that, you know, a lot of religious believers you know, want, in a way, and yet it's respectful of suffering in the world. It it realizes there's lots of that. Do you you think there's anything in Locke's, like, presence in the classroom or his way of doing philosophy that you tried to take on? Oh, Lord, I've, I've tried hard to emulate him in a lot of ways. The big thing for me about Locke's is that I, when I met him for the first time, I'd never seen someone who looked so happy. Profoundly happy person. And he... He grew up, though, seeing lots of death. Right? Yeah, he tells that story on our, when he was on the show the first time. Right. Bombings, you know. His, his family fled, you know, Eastern Europe to, the, to Canada... So it's not that he isn't aware of suffering. 
he's not he's not an ignorant kind of you know uh, ignorance is bliss kind of happy yeah and so the the first thing I wanted to emulate was I wanted to figure out how to be that happy what brought me to philosophy was genuinely wondering how to live a happy life and I, I found that the philosophers were the ones most profoundly kind of thinking through that question and I loved Aristotle on that. And Locke's is very much inspired by Aristotle. As far as, as the classroom goes, I mean, the central thing that... I mean, honestly, Locke's, as an individual, was a huge player in why I think philosophy as a profession has moved to the degree that it has towards, you know, caring about how, how and why philosophy matters. So, so in my teaching, the first thing I emulate, as far as he goes, is attention to that. Always paying attention to how and why what we're talking about matters. In fact, my very first, it was a quarter system at Ohio University, my very first quarter teaching a class, I taught a logic course. And I got a lot of students early on wondering, why are we studying this? Why are we doing this? You know, understanding how to diagram arguments and to write logical proofs and stuff. Proofs. Yeah. And in that first quarter, I had a student give me my favorite example of why philosophy matters. Well, he said that his, his mother had gotten a letter refusing half of the money owed for her health insurance claim. Uh-huh. And he said that he read the argument and was astonished by how poor the argument was. And so he drafted an analysis of the argument, criticizing it, explaining how she was, in his view, totally entitled to the funds she was owed. And he sent the letter to the insurance company. He told me that, you know, two weeks later, he got a call asking who their lawyer was. <laughs> And then he said, I don't have a lawyer. And then a few weeks later, they got the rest of the money. And this, by the way, it wasn't like some, you know, brown-nosing A student. I th I, in honesty, I think the guy got a C in my class. Yeah. But he passed, and he really saw the value of, and power. I think that's the thing a lot of people don't realize. There's power to being good at arguing. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed this further segment of Philosophy Bakes Bread, our special French toast episode of 2019, looking back at 2018. Anthony, you want to wrap this up with me? Yeah, I was just, man, listening to this recording and looking at the photos from the trip. It's just what a magical time we had. It was, <laughs> it really was absolutely perfect. It was and, quite an experience. In every way. And if you're in and around Maine or if you're not and you just want to head up there, I would check out Aperon Expeditions. How can they look it up, Eric? Well, if they if they get on the World Wide Web, they can find the the, the website for the company at A P E I R O N Aperon expeditions.com and if you want to see pictures of our outing and how beautiful it was up there in Maine head over to philosophybakesbread.com and click on episode 74 and on the post for that episode you'll see a whole bunch of pictures of just how gorgeous it was up there in Maine last July it, it really was and we'll be back in just a minute with another few tasty bites of this French toast episode <laughs> of philosophy bakes bread Welcome back, everyone, to Philosophy Bakes Bread. This is Anthony Cascio with my co-host, Eric Weber, and you're listening to a special French toast episode of <laughs> Philosophy Bakes Bread. We've taken some leftover crumbs and pieces of bread from the year 2018. We're, we're sopping them up in some tasty sauces, maybe some vanilla, some cinnamon. We're some serving egg. them up to you. Oh, yeah, I got to have egg. And hopefully you're, you're finding them as delicious as we do. Always always nice to do kind of a retrospective. In this last segment, we're, Eric and I are going to talk about our, some of our favorite episodes of 2018, the only ones that kind of jumped out at us, though 
frankly, they all did. Were they great? Yeah. Um, what we liked about them. Uh, we have some jokes to tell you because how can we not yeah, torture right? you with our jokes? And then we'll ask you you all a question. Yeah, sound good. So, Eric. Yo. What do you think? How do you think 2018 went? Philosophy of Baked Bread style. Do you think we baked some bread? We did. You know, one of the big differences is that we recorded half as many episodes because we were doing a new episode every two weeks. But at the same time, you know, we, we actually had just as many downloads in our second year as our first year. So j- though we're putting out fewer episodes, we kept pace with our first year. And uh, I, I guess Half as many episodes, but full quality. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, what that says to me is that is that word is spreading, and pe- you know, more and more people are listening. And even though we're doing fewer episodes, and and it's, it's which we it's, love. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, it's listening. really awesome. You know, I, I, the the nice thing is, I have a pretty easy time telling you which one was my favorite episode for 2018, because we had a really, for me anyway, really meaningful episode talking with the lovely Dr. Annie Davis Weber, my wife. I mean, now, now, technically, I'm trying to think of exactly when that episode aired on the radio, but but it, it was released. right at the end of the year, 2017. Exactly. exactly. So it was. Mm-hmm. It might have been our very first episode released or right around there. It was first our first episode. live episode, too. I called it, it for that one. It was. It was. It was Released in the podcast in 2018, anyway. So that's that's what I'm going off of when it when it so came well, out. You're, just, you're biased, is what you're saying. I, I'm biased, know. but it was it was you're, about you're, finding. You're married, you're married. You're married to the the host, and yeah. No, it well, that was that was episode, episode number 59. I want to say a little something about it. Of course, I'm a little biased, and I, and I love this lady we had on the show. You know, in episode 59, it was called Finding Peace, and just for a little bit about why, you know, the this whole show. One of the first motivations for it was that philosophy so profoundly helped me to be happy despite my daughter's great medical difficulties. And so that's where actually the pilot episode first began. And then a year later, we had the we took the opportunity to to interview Annie, my my wife, about a similar right. point because philosophical ideas helped her too. They were slightly different. But they were greatly helpful for her, too. And that's what we talked about with her. And so, you know, I've got a couple of reasons why it really moved me. And part of it is I think she's hella cute, you know, but but the other part of it is that the subject matter was pretty important to me. So, you know, that's that's where the show began for me. And that's that's so I have an easy answer of which one was my favorite episode of of 2018. It was episode 59, Finding Peace with Dr. Annie Davis Weber. Anthony? Have you oh, got a boy. favorite? A one favorite? I, I think that might be impossible. Uh, I really uh, we had some amazing interviews this year. We're gonna let you uh, off the hook then. All right. Yeah, we we did the existentialism and romantic love. I I've always liked the two of my favorite things. That's uh, right. Romantic love and existentialism. Sky Cleary was just a, always a delight to talk to. Uh, she was. That was we? episode sixty. So that was actually the very next episode. The next episode. Yeah. We had the the the, the multicultural manifesto. That was fun with episode Brian 72. Van Norton. Yeah, and as someone who really enjoys talking about Asian philosophy and sort of getting philosophy beyond the bounds of just sort of the Western canon. I, I really enjoyed that episode and the ideas in in it. Yeah, yes. let me say let me say one word about existentialism and romantic love. First oh, of yeah. all, first of all, it was it was actually our most downloaded episode of 2018. So if people are wondering, you know, what's what's a great place to start to get hooked? Well, that might be one. And on yes. top of that, f- February is you know is right around the corner for us as we record this. So actually, a group here in Lexington is going to get together and talk about the that episode and its content in a local Sophia chapter meeting. About about existentialism and romantic love. I think it's going to be a ton of fun. We're going to do it right around Valentine's Day. It's going to be a ton of fun. I sometimes teach on uh, the philosophy of love, so I'll be assigning that episode to fun. my students. Fun. Because, yay. <laughs> and, and, and you so, know? So, so you well, mentioned you mentioned that one and you mentioned the Multicultural Manifesto. Were those right. two your favorites or were you still going? You got, you got oh, I'm still, going? I don't know. I'm just trying to go off the top of my head. We had the one on the Not So Golden Rule with Dan Flores. And that one's just, I, I thought it was challenging. I'm not sure I agree with him. I think I might. He, was, he, he convinced me on a lot of things. Episode uh, 71. Jane, 71. We had... Yeah. We did. We did Jane Adams and democratic activism. Well, and that, now, say um, say a word about these things, right? Like, what 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 was that basically about, about the, the the no, not so golden rule? 
Oh, right. It was about the idea. I don't want to say about it, Eric. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I really didn't want to because my brain is farting on me. Oh, you know, dude. the not so golden rule one is, right? He was arguing the, the, the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Doesn't actually work in, 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 in under analysis. So there's a lot of ways that it, it has certain weaknesses and we can uh, reevaluate it in certain ways that it maybe make it stronger and there might be some better ethical guides for us. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It, it, it was, was impressive. Conversation. It was impressive because it's one of those moral ideas that's so intuitive that we just, as a knee jerk reaction, would you want someone to do that to you? You know, you might say to a kid, if, if the kid is pulling, you know, a woman, a young girl's ponytail, Hey, would you want someone to pull your hair? You know, like it's, it's a very knee jerk reaction to, to bring up the golden rule. And he gave us really interesting reasons to, to be worried about how applicable it is. I, th- I thought that was fascinating. Yeah. And the argument was tight and, and exciting. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was really, really fantastic. So you, you uh, mentioned the not so golden rule. What else you got? Yeah. Oh boy. Marilyn Fisher and the uh, Jane Adams and democratic activism. We've that had a few fun. Jane Adams episodes this year. She's That's become, true. The, the, she, the second one hasn't our, come out yet though. It hasn't come out yet, but what? Well, Look out, guys. There's another Jane Adams episode coming, and Jane Adams is awesome. She is. The, the philosophers we talk to who work on Jane Adams are also awesome. And so just those conversations, learning about Jane Adams, learning about the whole house, learning about thinking about what democracy means right. and what democratic activism mean. And, you and, know, and that was especially episode, right now we're, yeah. <laughs> in our current, just to be vague about it, our current political climate. Well, and, yeah, and that that's, was episode that's, that's, that's 67, here. we should mention. 67, 67. That's right. We we had a number of, of really fun and, and exciting episodes. I got feedback from a listener who said that episode 66 on disability and popular culture with John Lagore or John Altman, depending on how he wants to be referred to, was an incredibly powerful episode, according to one of our listeners. And I, I agree. You know, he's a an independent scholar who's very impressive and had rich things to say. And it was just, I was very moving, especially that first segment. Actually, the listener mentioned that in particular, that first segment was incredibly powerful about, really about who was. he is and about his life, you know? Yes. Yeah. He took that question very seriously, which I and honestly. appreciated and enjoyed and honest. And it was, it was, it was beautiful. So that was, was episode beautiful. 66. 66. And this is just, I'm just literally scratching the surface here. What, what about you? You, you mentioned yeah. the Finding Peace episode. Do you have any other ones, Eric? Yeah, two, two more I've got to mention. There, there were an awful lot that, that, that were awesome. And, and you're right, it's hard to, to pick one, except <laughs> in my case, it's easier because my wife was in it. But the outdoor education episode was super fun. So people in this today's episode are hearing some like leftover snippets from that, basically, from that trip. But I just, I really had a tremendous time with the episode on outdoor education. It? We recorded it. We just kind of we we we'd been canoeing all day, and we right. just got to the campsite. We set up camp, and then we pulled out our recorders, and we sat around a, a picnic table, basically. Yeah, and, and the, the birds were out. I'm just I clearly I just have this very sharp memory of it. And the birds are out singing, and the the rivers just you know flowing by. And <laughs> I, I remember like, oh, squirrels making. I should, I should do all philosophy this way. If do I you, could do that, that would be that would be the way to do it. Do you remember the squirrels? <laughs> I do remember the squirrels. I remember the squirrels, and I remember that night. Yeah. Did you remember that night yeah. and how it was? It was no moon out at, at least at first, and there was no clouds, and you could just see. Oh yeah, this, the Milky Way. Just as, as I've never seen it that sharp before in my life. It was and unbelievable it was, how many stars you could actually see. Stunning. You know, Alex actually slept outside under the on the on the, right now on the bank of the river. I didn't know that. that night. I yeah. Didn't that. Well, also as we were talking. Alex was actually literally baking bread in a Dutch oven on a fire, a campfire. You know, you remember that? Mm-hmm. Philosophers baking bread. That's right. That's yep. right. One more episode I got to mention was with Citizen Sanders or, or, or Mark Sanders from UNC Charlotte on democracy and public exposure. We, we playfully called the episode. It was about democracy and public engagement. And that was episode 63. That one wasn't a lot of fun. Mar- Mark is a that great guy. That was fun. And we recorded that episode at the in uh, uh, Boulder, Colorado. That's true. The hotel room at the public. What was it? The Public Philosophy Network conference. That's public right. Public Philosophy Network. And we're actually going to Denver again, but not for the Public Philosophy Network this year. In 2019, we're going for the Central Division meeting of the American Philosophical Association. That's going to be getting together in Denver 
this February of 2019. That's going to be fun. We should do some interviews while we're there. Yes, yes. It's always busy at these conferences, but yes. Oh, is that the episode where with, 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 uh, it is? Mark came up with the philosophy bakes bread drinking game. <laughs> That's true. I forgot about that. <laughs> Every time Eric says indeed, <laughs> indeed, take a, take a sip. indeed. <laughs> and every time you say, I like that, I, like that. Drink. Sorry, I was trying to remember what it was. <laughs> what do I, say? I like that, Mark. I like that. That That's is good. funny. So, Anthony, should we tell a few jokes? You know, yeah, you- if, if you know, I, what would an episode of Philosophy Bakes <laughs> Bread be if we weren't torturing people with our with our with our dead humor? <laughs> say, philosophies. <laughs> Say philosophies. Yeah, they're funny. <laughs> well, in general, we we try to make our jokes somehow reflect the content, but you know, this is a French toast episode, so we're gonna sort of go into our grab bag of jokes that we gathered over the year, and so these may not be so centrally tied to a theme, but that's part. I guess that's part of the point. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. A classics professor goes to a tailor to get his trousers mended. The tailor asks. Euripides? The professor replies, yes, Eumenides? Oh, Lord. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man, that was bad. A Roman walks into a bar and asks for a martinus. You mean a martini, the bartender asks? The Roman replies, if I wanted a double, I would have asked for it. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) jeez. Boy. (laughs) Latin jokes. Oh, my God. They're quote-unquote intellectual jokes, which means they're not very funny. Mm. Mm. All right, here's another one. A neutron walks into a bar and asks, how much for a beer? The bartender replies, for you, no charge. Oh, geez. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> we we don't have a guess to, to gauge how, how <laughs> terrible or funny these are. All right. All right. It's hard to explain puns to kleptomaniacs because they always take things literally. Oh, gee. <laughs> yeah, let's wrap this up, dude. Right. We had a question for our listeners. Do you yeah. want to ask it? Yeah, sure. So, so you know, we have you tell me segments or, or you know, opportunities to invite past guests back or what have you. You know, in this case, we, we're going to be playful. We're, this is our French toast episode thinking about 2018. And we genuinely want to know from our listeners, which were your favorite episodes of 2018 or which was your favorite episode and or you know, what was your favorite moment or insight or, or joke or what have you from 2018 in Philosophy Bakes Bread? So let us know what you think. We'd love to hear from you, and we always love to hear from you. I want to thank you guys for sticking with us over the past few years and baking some bread and growing this uh, wonderful podcast and being involved in the Society of Philosophers in America, which is Sophia, which sponsors this podcast and it's just been a really wonderful time yeah and and you know one of my favorite things about this show is when we get listener voicemails so you know when we give you the number in a in a minute here please consider calling and and leaving us a message we we absolutely love it and and we also have to give a couple more thank yous first of all to our you know our callers including Sean and Rob and whoever was the the person who g- gave us that George Carlin quote. I, I, we didn't get your name, but thank you for that. Um, and it's not joking. We, we, we genuinely get giddy when we hear it's, it's our uh, favorite thing, I think. Yeah. And, and of course we got to thank Ben Vockley, Seth Walton and Alejandro strong. Once again, of Aperon expeditions, A P E I R O N expeditions.com. Go check out the website. And I hope you enjoy that episode, episode 74 that where we, you know, talked with them originally about outdoor education. Thanks so much to them once more. Thanks guys. And, and, and you know what? We'll get together again soon. You know what? Th- thanks to the radio station, WRFL. And especially mm-hmm. my biggest thanks goes to, Anthony Cashier. Thanks for doing this with me, bud. Oh, thank you, Eric, and thank you for uh, having me along on this ride. It's been it's been a lot of fun. So, thanks everyone for listening yeah. to this episode of Philosophy Bakes Bread, little French toast episode. <laughs> we really hope you've enjoyed it. It's kind of something new for us. So, let us know if you like it or not. Actually, or or don't. Uh, don't well, like let it. us know if you so like, know it. If you like that, it right yeah we, we enjoyed we enjoyed recording it and we hope to do it again in the future it's, it's a fun way to kind of pull in all the stuff that we we loved but that we didn't get a chance to use yeah little 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 snippets that we haven't had a chance to use yet but we loved so much and we didn't 
we wanted to serve them up to you guys. Yeah, we really enjoy those. Remember, everyone, you can catch us on Twitter, Facebook, and on our website at philosophybakesbread.com. And there you'll find transcripts for many of our episodes. And one more thing, folks, if you want to support the show and to be more involved in the work of the Society of Philosophers in America, SOFIA, the easiest thing to do is to go consider joining as a member at philosophersinamerica.com. If you're enjoying the show as much as we are, we hope you'll take a second to rate and review us on wherever you're listening to us today, Apple Podcasts, we're on YouTube, we're on Spotify, so take a quick second. It means so little effort on your part and such tremendous payoff, right? And we really appreciate you taking a second to rate and review us. And you can, of course, always email us at philosophybakesbread at gmail.com. And you can also call us and leave a short recorded message with a question or a comment that we may be able to play on the show at 859-257-1849. That's 859-257-1849. Join us again next time on Philosophy Bakes Bread, food for thought about life and leadership. If you're enjoying this podcast from WRFL Lexington, you may enjoy our live radio stream at WRFL.FM and, of course, via radio at 88.1 FM in the central Kentucky area. We have a wide variety of programs you're sure to enjoy. Just go to WRFL.FM slash schedule and see what programs appeal most to you. Thanks again for listening to this podcast from WRFL Lexington.